This past Tuesday was Election Tuesday uh, in America. And whether you are grieving or celebrating, whether you are angry, confused, relieved that it's over, or apathetic, one thing about Election Day in America is that it reminds us that we get to be about something different in the church. Now, while it is a blessing and a gift from God to be able to vote for a government, it is even greater blessing to be able to gather together and to meet with Jesus as his church. You see, government and church are both gifts from God. Sometimes it's easy to think that they're really kind of the same gift. That the government is responsible for passing laws and enforcing rules at God's behest and his command. He created it. And sometimes you can show up to church and we open our Bibles and there are rules there. And we talk sometimes about the discipline of God. And we might start to think that these are the same thing. That really what we're interested in is rules and enforcing a certain behavior or lifestyle. But nothing could be further from the truth. Government has its place. But the church is not ultimately about rules. It's about a relationship. It's about being able to engage with the God who created us, with the God who loves us, and with the God who desperately wants to know us. And be known by us. This morning we get to understand that what we're doing here this morning. Is not about trying to figure out what the rules are that we can obey them. What we're doing here this morning. Is experiencing a relationship. A real genuine back and forth give and take relationship. With the God of the universe. And we get to think about that relational aspect of what we're doing by thinking about Jesus, the healer. In just a minute, we're going to turn to the book of Matthew and we're going to hear about how Jesus came among us and did amazing, miraculous healings. This is going to give us the opportunity to think about how ultimately we're not just about, we're not about rules. We're about a connection with a God who wants to heal us, but also allow us to think through what does it mean for God to be our healer today? So let me invite you to take a Bible and turn to the book of Matthew chapter four, Matthew chapter four. If you need a Bible, there should be one in the rack in front of you. If you take that Bible and turn to page 785, you'll be in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4. Matthew, chapter 4. I'm going to read for us verses 23 to 25. Matthew 4, page 785. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. Here in this short little three-verse explanation of what Jesus was about, we have seven seven different words for healing or sickness or illness. I have a chart here to show you. There are some differences among them. The first word, verse 23, healing every disease, that's the Greek word nosos, 
And it literally means, no surprise, disease or illness. It's kind of a general category for all of the illnesses or diseases we might go through. The second word, sickness, is the Greek word malachia. And this is more of a malady or a weakness resulting from disease. So if nosos, if the first one is cancer, the second word is really the symptoms that go with cancer. And so this is simply describing people who are suffering from the symptoms associated with various sicknesses and illnesses. The third phrase the NIV translates with ill with various diseases. This is the Greek word kakos. And it means being in ill health. This might be something like uh, chronic uh, fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia, sort of the idea where you just are chronically in a difficult place. Ill health, uh, susceptible to sickness. The fourth word Severe pain, bosonois. This isn't technically an illness or sickness word, but this has to do with pain like migraines or back pain, just the simple suffering that someone might go through, which may or may not be tied to a particular illness, but just the fact that living in these bodies, we are subjected often to intense, excruciating, difficult, debilitating pain. The fifth word, We translate it demon-possessed. That's not really the best translation. The Greek word is daimonizomai, and it simply means demonized. You can kind of hear it there. There's not a separation in the Bible between people who are demon-possessed and other people who are not. Everybody in the Bible who is experiencing spiritual warfare is considered demonized. And so that's what this refers to, all of the various ways that someone might go through spiritual warfare. The sixth word is the word for seizures. It's selenizomai. And this is like epilepsy or strokes or those sorts of things where you are suffering in that way. The last word is paralyzed, paralutikos. You can hear the word paralytic in there. And it means being unable to walk or having something physically wrong where your body, uh, your arm doesn't work or whatever it may be. Seven different words in two verses. And the point Matthew is trying to get across is Jesus showed up and healed everything. (laughs) Anything you could possibly imagine. Every sickness, every illness, every spiritual warfare, every malady, every symptom, there's just everything. There's a lot more words he could have used, but in two verses, Matthew is trying to get the point across. When Jesus came on the scene, he did every different possible kind of healing. If you've ever seen the TV series The Chosen, in season two, there's a great episode where this is sort of envisioned. And I love seeing it because you read it in the text, but when you sort of watch it on the screen, you see a whole line of people that goes on for who knows how long, and Jesus is there kind of, and there's this little tent, and they're just lined up to be healed. And you realize, you know, in the Bible, in the Gospels, we probably have stories of, I don't know, maybe like 30 different individuals that we know get healed where we're told their story individually. Sometimes you might think, well, that was probably all that Jesus did. This verse, these verses remind us, no, that's just a very tiny sliver of the healings Jesus did. That during his time on earth, he healed thousands of people. That probably here, there are hundreds lined up. And the great thing in the chosen is they show Jesus sort of like from the very early in the morning until very late at night, and he's exhausted. But what you've got is people coming to him with every different possible kind of disease. And the remarkable thing about this, Jesus is healing people of things we still can't heal them of today. With all the medical research we have, with all of the millions of people who are looking for cures, with all of the scientific advancements and technology, there were people in this long line that Matthew is envisioning who Jesus, they come forward and he heals them. Demon possession, seizures, 
strokes, symptoms, migraines, cancer, unknown diseases, they're all in line. And Jesus just heals them one after another after another. Nobody has ever done anything like that. We have no stories of any healers ever doing anything that looks like this. This is Jesus, the healer. This is the God who has power over all things, who desperately hates sickness, disease, pain, and suffering, and what it's done to this beautiful world that he's created. And here we have this great picture of Jesus, the healer. But seeing this picture raises a couple of questions. One, why is Jesus doing all of these healings? And secondly, if you're a Christian, should you expect him to do this kind of healing today? Well, let's take that first question. You might think the obvious answer to why is Jesus doing all of these healings? Because people are sick. And you wouldn't be wrong, but I think there's more to it than that. Look again at verse 23. Jesus went throughout Galilee, and he's doing three things. Teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. Now, at first glance, you could read that and think Jesus has got sort of three activities, like his daily planner is open, three things I got to do. I got to do some teaching, I got to do some claiming, and I got to do some healing. Today's my healing day, I'm going to do that healing. But I think these are not three separate activities. I think these are three mutually interpreting activities that help us get after the bigger thing that Jesus is up to, which is neither teaching nor proclaiming, nor healing, that those, none of those individual activities are the big thing. That those three things are about something bigger. What do I mean? Well, look down after the end of our verse 25. We've got a chapter break, which is that large five, which sometimes makes us think, okay, like a big gap takes place. But in reality, there wasn't any chapter break when Matthew originally wrote this. Look what Jesus does next. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, those are the crowds that had gathered because he's healing everybody under the sun, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. And what follows in Matthew 5, 6, 7, and 8 is what's called the Sermon on the Mount. This, bar none, is the greatest sermon that has ever been preached anywhere, at any time, by anyone. It is staggering how powerful and amazing this sermon is. Jesus is about to go up on a mountainside And he is going to give the sermon. This is the sermon all other sermons ever given before or after pale in comparison to the Sermon on the Mount. It has more famous quotes than any other sermon in all of history. I can't wait until we get to spend some time in this sermon. You're going to hear phrases Over and over, powerful things. Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. Turn the other cheek. Love your enemies. Do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough worries about his own. You cannot love, you cannot serve both God and money. Over and over again there are statements of such power and such insight and such truth. The Sermon on the Mount contains the most well-known, most quoted verse in the Bible. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. (laughs) 
Catholics, Protestants, Orthodox, all over the world say that verse some every week, some every day. It is the most well-known verse in the entire Bible. I would claim in all of human history. And it's in the Sermon on the Mount. This is the sermon. It is the pinnacle of teaching. But look what happens at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. So turn over, Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7, all one sermon. We're going to spend some time in it in coming weeks. But look what follows in chapter 8. When Jesus came down from the mountainside, this is chapter 8, verse 1, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the, offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. What's Jesus doing before the greatest teaching in human history? Healing. What is Jesus doing after the greatest teaching in human history? Healing. This is not an accident. If you think that Jesus simply showed up to hand us a bunch of rules and regulations, we've missed the point. The reason why Jesus heals before the great teaching and the reason why Jesus heals after the great teaching is because he is trying to help us understand it's not simply about teaching. It's not like God just simply dropped a book out of heaven and said, here, obey this. It's not like a constitution or a set of laws. It's not like a bill of rights. Jesus heals before and Jesus heals after so that we don't think it's simply about head knowledge, a list of rules, a bunch of stuff we're supposed to obey. It's about a relationship. It's about a connection with the God who not only wants to teach us truth, but who wants to heal us, who is concerned for the diseases that we are going through, who sees the symptoms, the pain, the spiritual warfare, the illness, and the death we struggle with and can't stand to abandon us to it. Jesus' teaching leads to his healing. And his healing leads to his teaching. But there's more than that. Notice that it says we're still in chapter 8. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I love that. It's a sign of relationship. It's a sign of connection. The man has leprosy. No one wants to touch him. But God does. God literally reaches out a human hand in the person of Jesus and touches this man that no one will come anywhere near. Jesus says, I am willing, I am more than willing to make you clean. But look what he says in verse four. See that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded. In the book of Leviticus, there's a very clear instructions. If you get healed from leprosy or a skin disease, if you've had that, there's certain things you have to do if it goes away. And so Jesus says to the man, you got to go do exactly what was said in Leviticus 14. Why? The last phrase. As a testimony to them. Well, a testimony to who? The priests? They don't have leprosy. What's this a testimony of? It's not a testimony that Jesus can heal. It's a testimony that because Jesus is healing, the kingdom of God has come near. 
It's a testimony to the priests that Jesus is here not just to heal. Look, if he was here just to heal, why would he say, don't go tell anyone? If the goal was to heal as many people as possible, he would have said to this man, go tell all your friends, tell everybody you know, let's get everybody lined up so we can get them all healed. No, the point is not teaching. The point is not healing. The point is not even proclaiming the kingdom of God. The point is, in the proclamation, in the teaching, and in the healing, we see the essence of what Jesus is doing. He's come to have a relationship with us. That involves him guiding us in all truth. That includes him dealing with the fact that we live in a sinful, broken, fallen, sick world. And that involves him announcing the good news that God loves us, that God does not leave us in our own sins and does not leave us in the midst of a world that is full of darkness and death and satanic power, but that God came among us in the person of Jesus so that he might die on a cross for our sins, be raised from the dead, and provide for us ultimate, true, total healing. Salvation. Truth. Life. All through our connection to Jesus. He heals so he can teach. He teaches so that he can proclaim salvation. He proclaims salvation so that he can bring healing. These three things all work together. To say God's not interested in a bunch of people trying to follow rules. What God wants is a relationship. God wants to reach out and touch us. God wants to be present with us in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of our struggle. God wants to show us the truth and God wants to provide for us eternal life. Meaning that when you are a believer, a believer in Jesus dies, you will be raised from the dead and healed totally and completely of all sadness, all sickness, all suffering, all war, all struggle, all issues. This is why Jesus has come. There are three things I'd like us to take away from that this morning. The first is that's the value of what we're doing here this morning. We gather together to meet with Jesus. Jesus promised us in the Gospel of Matthew that when we gather together on Sunday morning throughout the week as his church, he is uniquely present with us. Jesus, the healer, people were lined up for miles to get healed. Think of the gift he's given to us now. We get to meet with him here in this place. Every time we gather together, he is present with us. This is why as grateful as we are for the technology that allows people to sort of watch online, and as much as we recognize that is a good thing for people who cannot physically come and be present with us, that when Jesus shows up to heal the man, he doesn't just wave his hand from heaven. The point is relationship, and so he comes close enough to us to be able to touch us. He becomes one of us. This is not distant learning. This is not, well, the Sermon on the Mount. Yes, if all it was about was either the healing or the teaching, God could have just simply stayed in heaven. But it's not about that. It's about relationship. And in order for there to be relationship, he has to draw close to us, and we have to draw close to him. That's why he's running after us. That's why his goodness is hunting us down and chasing us. If it was simply about slavery and obedience, he could just say the word and we would have to do whatever he told us to do. If it was simply about healing right now, he could just say the word and everybody everywhere would be healed instantly. But it's not. It's about a relationship. And so Jesus came among us so that we might know him 
so that he might know us, so that we could talk to him, so that he could talk to us. And that's the beauty of what we're doing on a Sunday morning. It's the beauty of what we do when we gather together as a church. Second thing to take away from this is we got to talk about that question, does Jesus still heal people today? If Jesus is present in his church, if he's here this morning and God heals people, should we expect that Jesus will heal people today? Yes. Just last week, Pastor Tom got this email. It says, Pastor Tom, last Sunday you prayed over me that my cancer would not relapse and doctors would be given wisdom and for the healing of my pleural effusion. On Thursday, the door opened to a new physician who took things very seriously and ordered an emergency CT scan on Friday, concerned the cancer had returned. Saturday, the results were in. The pleural effusion they had previously seen was now gone. The scan was negative for everything. A divine, miraculous healing, all praise and glory goes to God. On the first Tuesday of every month, in obedience to Jesus' command, we gather together the elders of the church to pray over people who are suffering in every different kind of way possible. Spiritual warfare, pain, unexplained pain, symptoms, illness, whatever it may be. We've done this for many years, and anecdotally speaking, I have seen lots, hundreds of people come through for prayer with the elders. Anecdotally speaking, I would say that about 25% of those who come through for prayer for healing with the elders get miraculously healed by Jesus. The same way you see happening here in Matthew 4. No medical intervention, no explanation for it. It was there, now it's gone. Sometimes it happens immediately, sometimes it takes time, but about 25% of the cases, there is no other explanation except for the fact that we prayed and Jesus did what we asked him to do and healed people. Miraculously, powerfully, all praise and glory to God. Another 25%, I would also call miraculous, but they do usually involve medical intervention. And after people sort of report back, we've prayed for you, how did it go? We hear something like the doctors cannot, they're astounded by how well the surgery went or the medicine that statistically shouldn't have worked ended up working. Whatever it may be, another 25% of those is really like, look, clearly God was involved and yes, he obviously used the medical or the psychological or the uh, psychiatrist or whatever it may be, but through that he did stuff that really nobody genuinely expected. So the answer to the question is, yes, Jesus still absolutely heals today, especially in the church because this is where he's present. That's why he says, call the elders of the church. This is where I am. Come to me and experience healing. Now, for those of you who are good at math, you're like, well, 25% plus 25%. That's only 50%. What about the other 50%? I would say for the other 50%, they did not receive what they were coming to ask for, meaning healing, or somehow relief from the spiritual warfare, whatever it may be. But I have seen over and over again that what they have received might be something they didn't expect, like a friend who came to faith in the middle of the situation who they had been praying for for a long time. I've seen people receive a word of encouragement directly from Jesus into their heart. Basically saying, this isn't going to go away yet, but I'm going to be with you. I've seen overwhelming peace. I've seen Jesus heal relationships. I've seen Jesus heal other things going on in the person's life. I've seen God draw incredibly close and incredibly near. And that's because it's not ultimately about healing. It's about a relationship. If Jesus' purpose 
was simply to heal us of everything that ever went wrong in our lives. Well, he would just have to spend the rest of eternity doing that. And 100% of the people who come for healing should receive it. But Jesus' ultimate goal is not healing. Healing is a means to an end. Jesus heals some so that all will know that they are loved. And so this morning, what is on offer to you and I is not a list of rules that we have to obey, nor is it a magical genie who will cure all of our diseases. What is being offered to you and I this morning is a God who loves us totally and completely. A God who loves us so much that he would come and join us in our pain so he might reach out to us. A God who loves us so much that he would build his church so that we could continue to meet with him week after week, day after day. A God who loves us so much that sometimes he chooses not to heal us because he loves us. And so what I'd like you to do this morning is I'd like everybody in the sanctuary, those watching online as well, to close your eyes and bow your heads. And what I'm offering to you, and again, this is just in the silence of your heart for you to think this through. What Jesus is offering to you today is a real relationship with him. And all you need to do in the quiet of your heart is listen to the words I'm about to tell you and think about them for a minute. This Jesus that we are talking about, this Jesus that we are reading about, this Jesus that did these miraculous things, this person, this human being, is himself the very God of the universe come among us. That he is God in human form. And that Jesus came and lived among us, did miraculous healings. This same Jesus was put to death on a cross, even though he was sinless. He died for your sins and for mine. He died for your mistakes and for mine. He died for your shortcomings and for mine. And three days later, God raised him from the dead. He was buried in the ground and God raised him from the dead. And this same Jesus is currently seated at God's right hand. He will come again from heaven to the earth to judge all people, the living and the dead. This same Jesus is present here this morning. You can't see him with your eyes, but you can feel him with your heart. And his goodness is running after you. If you want a relationship with this Jesus, if you want eternal life, if you want the possibility of healing in this life and the guarantee of ultimate healing at death, all you have to do right now in the quiet of your heart is say yes. You don't have to do anything else. You don't have to agree to join the church. You don't have to give any money. You don't have to sign up to follow a bunch of rules. Just right now in the quiet of your heart, Jesus is inviting you to be his friend. Jesus is inviting you to accept him as Lord. Jesus is asking you to let him save you. And all you have to do is say yes. So take just a minute. This is not a small decision. If someone were asking you to marry them, you need to be ready to say, I do. Take just a minute. Think about that invitation. For those of you who are already Christians, this is a good chance to be reminded. You can ask right now for Jesus to heal you of whatever it is you're going through. But if he chooses not to, please don't think he doesn't love you. 
He's come to have a relationship with you through the good and the bad. Take just a minute in the quiet of your hearts and then I'm going to close this in prayer. Jesus, accept these yeses that have been offered. Thank you for coming among us that you might win us to you. Thank you for wanting to have a relationship with us. We don't deserve it, but we are grateful. Amen.